and we're live. All right, so, um, <clears throat> we gave a brief description of micro versus macro last time, and uh, I want to start by giving you some of the keys to success keys to victory in this course. The most important resource you're going to have is your lecture notes. So these are kind of in order of importance. The lecture notes are important because um, it's going to be a, your best guide to what's on the exam. So guide to what's on the exam. It'll be, in some cases, an indication of the short answer problems, possibly similar short answer problems. Um, there's some stuff in the textbook that I don't cover, and there's some things I cover that aren't in the textbook. So some text not covered, some lecture, not much by the way, but some lecture not covered by text. And you are responsible for everything I go through in lecture. So if there comes a time where you miss a class, Make sure you get the notes from somebody. I don't have, I've got old notes up here that I sometimes follow and sometimes don't that I've been using for more or less uh, kind of add and subtract, but it's kind of a big mess. So I don't even have anything decent I can give you. Uh, so you're better off to get a classmate's notes. So make sure you get those notes. If you do miss a class, go through them and, and um, see uh, what you missed. Um, number two, homework. Number two on the list is definitely homework. So I explained last time with the general Lee and economic models, and so we're going to try to build a toolbox over time. What the homework is, is you using the tools to solve problems. So you need to exercise those tools. It's not good enough to just know the tools. You're not a mechanic yet. You got to know how to fix the car. So you need to know how to use those tools to fix the car. That's what the homework does for you. It goes through and applies different situations. What I've heard a lot of students say over time when they maybe are struggling in class is, you know, I come to every class, I listen, I get it. You're like, yeah, Russ, that's great, sounds awesome, makes perfect sense, perfectly logical, love econ. And then I see the test problem, or I see the homework problem, and I just don't get it. You have to be able to apply that knowledge to different situations, and that's what the homework's going to do. So again, that's all uh, online. Uh, I have it designed so that you're getting feedback, you're getting the answers, you can kind of uh, work through and um, you still have to be diligent about truly working it. Number three is the textbook. Textbook reading. So these are in order of importance, but I'm not trying, I have textbook in number three. I'm not trying to discount that too much, <clears throat> but if you were uh, if you blew off every single class and it's the night before the exam and you're like, oh, I just have to cram and do the best that I can, this would say, go look at your lecture notes. Don't start reading the text. Don't go in reverse order. So the, the, the normal progression would be to <clears throat> sit in class, possibly um, read ahead. I, I guess I, I've never been one. I know you've had other uh, professors that say, come prepared to class, read the chapter ahead of time. There are some classes that I do that with, but I didn't really ever learn that way, so I don't really expect you guys to do it that way. If you do do it that way, I think you'll be way ahead of the game because you're going to see things are going to make sense better when you're in lecture. 
but it's okay to come to lecture, learn, get kind of have me give you your first dose of it, read it, get your second dose, do the homework, get your third dose. That's going to start to build up your uh, your tools and your ability to be successful in the class. Okay. Uh, questions on that at all? So these are the keys to victory. So hopefully, set you up for success early. Uh, all right, we need to spend a little bit of time talking about um, some markets and, and the market system. So economics is fairly new in academia. About 1776, Adam Smith more or less uh, formalized the idea of capitalism and using markets to have uh, desired outcomes that there might be some sense. Think about prior to 1776, if you go back to the 1500s, the 1400s in Europe, how was society run? What's your picture of society? What does it look like? Who's running things? How, what are the people in society on, on their little island? What's going on in that system? Monarchy, right? So you got a king, you got a queen, they own everything, the rest of the people own nothing. <coughs> so we got a whole bunch of peasants and we got the king and queen. So we have kind of this uh, centrally planned system. So when Adam Smith first brought this out, it was <coughs> flying right in the face of tradition. Years, thousands of years of tradition of the way the world worked was brought forth a little differently in here. And so um, one of the things he discusses is the invisible hand of the market system. So in his world, this was opposed to the hand of the king and queen. You do this, you do this, let's do this over here, this over here. So we got this king and queen directing traffic. You go here, and he said, we can have some good things come about through the invisible hand uh, in the market system. All right, so here's the, he's somewhat poetic uh, in his language. And by the way, he, he really was known as a moral philosopher. Uh, of course, economics hadn't even been developed at that time. And so his first major work was called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, where he talked about morality and how that comes about. And in fact, he talked a lot about cooperative behavior and, and some other things on about life. And then his next major piece of work was The Wealth of Nations. And it's actually the nature and courses of a wealth of nations. But generally, people just call it the wealth of nations. And this is the book that everybody kind of glommed onto and has been, uh, I guess, the catalyst of, of capitalism. And here's a quote from that book It is not from the benevolence. of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker from which we expect our dinner. But from their regard to their own self-interest. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker from which we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. Now that 
thing is jam-packed full of different things. So let's dissect it for a moment. What does it mean to be benevolent? Goodness. What else? What's another cinnamon you might think for? Benevolent. To be benevolent. Selfless. Selfless. Kind. Generous. Charitable. Right? So it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker from which we expect our dinner. So we don't expect to just be fed by them through their goodness of their heart, but we do expect to be fed if they're looking out for themselves, if they're looking out for their own self-interest. That's kind of strange, isn't it? How does that work? What kind of system do we got going on here? So we might insert a few words that might not be totally appropriate. For self-interest, we might say greedy, if they're looking out for themselves. And then we think things are going to be good. We expect to be fed. As long as they're looking out for themselves and we don't expect them to just be charitable, we'll get fed too. Kind of weird. Their own self-interest is making a profit. So as long as they're in business, Okay, so um, Katie's bringing up uh, profit here, that they're looking for profit. But boy, it seems like the profit system has gotten a bad rap here. Do we get good results from the, from the profit system? Is that what uh, happened in the financial crisis, that as long as we got people looking out for profits, we get something good? What keeps that profit system in check? Competition. Competition's the key ingredient needed to have this system work appropriately. So, um, yes, they're looking for profit. What keeps that profit fair? So you might ask yourself the question, is profit fair? Should we, is profit okay? Would the world be better if we eliminated profits? Could we think of a system where we just didn't have profits? I mean, is that, is that the root of, of all evil, is profit? Tough questions. Let's go back to our story for a moment. I know some of you have heard this uh, story that had me before, but I think it's worth telling again. So let's suppose that the butcher is making a bunch of money, right? And so he's like, he's making uh, uh, his cutting up steaks and, and he then charging $8 a pound and he's like, you know what? I like money. Money's kind of fun. I can go, that means I can go buy more stuff. I bet I'd make more profit if I charged $12 a pound. So instead of $8 a pound, I'm just going to charge $12 a pound. Right? So he's going to make more profit, right? $4 more per pound. Uh, what's going to go from there? Nobody's going to buy it. Now, if he's the only steak place in town, are there still going to be some people who want to buy meat? Yeah. So we haven't uh, you know, formally developed demand for everyone here. Those of you who have had micro before, I don't think this will be too big of a shock here. But let's say he normally sells 100 steaks at $8 a pound. If we raise the price of steak to 12, people are going to quit buying, but not everybody. Some people were willing to pay $13 a pound. They still think $12 is a good price. Right? So it'll change the circumstance of the market. Maybe the butcher will only sell 50. So there's definitely something there. Um, but it's possible that the price effect can outweigh the quantity effect, and it can still be very profitable for him to just jack up prices. 
right? So that's the monopoly ideal. If we let if we let too much control go to one person, then possibly there could be some abuses and some obnoxious profits. So you guys mentioned competition. What happens next in this system after the butcher jacks up his prices? Talk to me about how competition works. Okay, if there was another firm and they were at eight, everybody would just go to that firm. But let's say there's no firm right now. There's no other butcher in town. Substitute it for the brewer or the baker. Okay, so are meat and beer a good substitute? Like, ah, I feel like a T-bone, but you know what? A 12 pack sounds fine too. So you're, you're on the right track. You're on the right track. But if I limit, and I'm, I'm kind of trying to get to a, this is kind of the idea of economic modeling. I'm saying, suppose we have a world where there's one guy that cuts meat, there's one gal that brews beer, and there's one guy that does bakery goods, right? So that's our world, that's our community we live in. And now all of a sudden, the butcher's jacking things up from 8 to 12. Someone else comes in, right? So that's the competition part, is that as long as there's no restrictions in the market that say some government, you know, if, if this guy's in bed with the uh, queen, where's my butcher? If the butcher's in bed with the queen, and in such a way that he developed a law that says only one butcher can be in our community, right? Pass a law like that. Only one butcher, he happens to have the license to be a butcher, now all of a sudden he's free to abuse the system as much as he wants. Do we have things like that maybe going on in the United States with lobbying of special interest groups? Yes, right? we have that type of situation potentially out there. Something that's very destructive to the market system, by the way, and capitalism. Capitalism is not based on the, it's all about who you know, not what you know. True capitalist system with healthy competition, both on the buying side and the selling side, are the ingredients needed to get good outcomes for society from the market system. And so those type of abuses need to be monitored and watched out for and, and eliminated as much as possible. And that's through good laws that protect uh, healthy competition. So assuming we don't have that law on the books, the baker starts saying, you know, this guy's just cutting meat. I, if you guys have ever baked stuff, I'm not a very good baker, but you gotta be much more precise and you have to know how to measure things. And so this baker's much more smarter maybe than the butcher, or at least he thinks he is. And he says, well, I've got this extra space in my building. I'm gonna open up a butcher shop. If he's getting 12 bucks, I know I can do it better and more efficient than him. I'm gonna open up my shop and have a price of $11 per pound and we'll just see what happens. So, he opens the shop, cuts his price to 11. What is the butcher forced to do if everybody starts going? Assuming that we have a fairly substitute, perfect substitutes now between the baker's meat and the butcher's meat, the original butcher, they flock to the baker. The butcher has to cut down to 11. And then maybe a few people come back to the butcher because they kind of like him. He's chummy. Well, now $8, let's say, is a, is a very tight price. Like, you know, they, they can do it. More would always be better. But they're pretty sustainable at 8 So then if both of them are split in the market 11 one of them's going to run a sale and cut the price to 10 The other one's going to be forced to cut it to 10 because there's extra fluff in that price, what we call uh, an abnormal profit. Profit above and beyond the true cost of doing business, the true opportunity cost of doing business. And so they get into a price war until there's no more squeezing left to do. I mean, ultimately they have to pay the rent for the building, they have to pay their employees, they have to pay for uh, cattle coming in on a, on a cart that they have to carve up, right? They have all of those costs of doing business and can they do it for zero profit? Is it possible for them to squeeze it down over the long haul? Would they have incentive to keep cutting meat if every dollar ends up going directly to 
the explicit cost of production? No, they don't have any incentive to do it, right? So what's a fair profit to do that? What's a fair profit? Okay, good. So um, is it 10%, is it 5%, is it 20%? I don't know. That depends probably on the risks that the entrepreneur is taking and providing that good, right? What is the risk of loss? What are the expenses? You know, is it, is it a volatile market? Do prices change? All kinds of stuff that come into play that we study in a, in a great deal in, on, in microeconomics. And so uh, what Katie had mentioned, why don't you say it a little bit louder, Katie? Well, to the point that nobody else is entering. Yeah, to the point where nobody else is entering or leaving, right? They kind of find the, the right price by jockeying around. And sometimes they might screw up. Like, you know, the, the baker says, well, I'm going to really get that butcher, and I'm going to charge seven. And then all of a sudden, he finds out he's losing money. And he's like, well, I can't do this. This isn't sustainable in the long run. In fact, i got to earn something. i got to, you know, my, my wife's going to kill me if I don't bring home a little bit of money for all this time and effort that I'm throwing into this business, right? <laughs> i got to have something I'm bringing home. What is that something? Well, it depends on that particular person's opportunity costs. What else could they be doing? We already know that the baker could be devoting time and efforts and resources to baking goods. All right? So there's an opportunity cost. Every slice of meat that they kick out, that baker could be focusing in on some bakery goods. So there's trade-offs and decisions that need to be made in that regard. And so maybe they cut the price too low, but eventually they're going to sort out. And now if we go to the uh, Walmart here in town or the Country Mart and we look up burger uh, for the 80% 80-20 meat we're probably going to find that those prices are pretty similar to each other right so each place needs to make a normal profit we might even stretch that to say a fair profit for the resources that are being devoted to that activity so how do we know profits are fair we kind of backdoor it and we say, is there healthy competition? Is it easy for companies to start up or exit? Are there any arrangements going on that's keeping healthy competition in the market? And so as long as there's healthy competition, in the long run, we'd expect profits to be fair in that industry. So whatever they're making on these phones, and when the media tells you that Apple made $20 billion, and we're like, whoa, $20 billion? Well, that's a lot of money. The economists would probably say, that's probably a fair profit. Why? Because I know that they're facing heavy competition from Samsung and other people that are always clamoring to try to undercut them, make something better, right? We got good competition in that technology market. So likely, $20 billion or whatever number they spew out at you is a fair profit. So we have comfort in competition as citizens on our little island here. Um, how do people make profit off of the price action? Like, what if for one company making that price will actually cause them to have a loss? Like, but then for the other one, profit? So the question was, how do companies make a profit on price matching type things? And the, the answer would be, there can always be short-term losses or gains. And so they're hoping that over the long haul, they'll keep people in their store. So on a price matching scheme, Walmart's classic, right? And I mean, there's lots of uh, stores like that that might have price matching. You have a whole shopping cart. You're all giddy because you got, uh, you bought this, their price tag said $1.75, and you saw Country Mart had it for $1.50, and you're like, I'm gonna stick it to Walmart. Excuse me, here, they had a coupon for this for $1.50. And then ring, ring, ring. You end up ringing up $100 worth of other goods, right? That's the thing they care about. So that gets into a little more complicated thing of bundling other, bundling other products. Who did I grab this from? Okay. I, like, I like my props. OK, any other comments? All right, so that's uh, a real quick snapshot of our market system. Um, that we live in and work in. And so I guess the takeaway from this is that the absolute key ingredient, in my mind, 
key ingredient to a successful um, capitalistic, I don't know if that's the right word, capitalistic system is competition. I would argue, and this is certainly not always the case, but I would guess most of the market problems can be traced back to a lack of competition in one way, shape, or form. Even an environmental hazard like pollution, we could possibly track back that, hey, nobody's looking out for the air quality, and so that's why it gets trashed, right? There's no competition in using air. And so um, we dive into specific places where the market doesn't work so hot. Um, those two, uh, three primary things are a lack of information, which again is a, something that can cause competition to fail, competition among buyers or sellers. One of the greatest things we've had over the last 20 years uh, in, on the buying side is definitely the internet. You guys are so much more informed than I was when I was your age on buying products and how quickly information comes to you. I mean, you had to really work at it to find out and learn about a product. I mean, you might have even had to take a trip to the library and get a book or do, do something, and now it's all at your fingertips. That's competition. That creates competition, and, and, and it actually uh, specifically helps level the playing field of information. In the past, typically with, with a, a, a market good, the seller knows a lot about the product, the buyer doesn't know as much. And so with cheap products, one way to do that, if you're just going to buy your $1.50 soda, is to buy it. You're only out a buck fifty, right? And so you learn by buying it whether you did. But if it's a bigger purchase that you're going to drop 200 bucks on some uh, sound system or something, now you might have to do a little more research and you might get stung by it if you didn't have that information. So the market might be a little inefficient in that sense that you're buying a good that you wouldn't have otherwise bought had you known the information ahead of time, right? So that information uh, that's out there on the internet has uh, done some great things for the efficiency of markets, bringing information to both buyer and seller. In the past, we'd uh, rely on government to force companies to do that. So on product labels, you can find calorie information, whether it's sodium, the number of ingredients. That's all, again, to level the playing field. If you have a peanut allergy, Likely, you wouldn't have bought that product that gave you hives or sent you to the hospital had you known it had peanuts. So we help the market, in some cases, by having some sort of regulation that forces information to go to level the playing field to both consumers and producers. In other cases, we don't need the government. The internet's out there, so more information is flowing to you that wasn't driven by government force or the government hand. So there's always this thought of which hand do we turn to, the hand of government or the invisible hand? We got to at least recognize that there's a lot of potential good that comes out by the invisible hand because we might eliminate, for one thing, special interests between groups going the government route because sometimes our public officials have private self-interests that trump public interests in some cases. Okay, so lack of information, um, externalities, external costs or benefits. So this would be pollution by the company who's making the product. Um, 
we could look at an external benefit of education. In general, on our island, we might prefer to have more smart people running around than dumb people because good, better things come out. We get better results of, of uh, people treating each other, less crime, a number of different things from having a more educated society. But you guys only act on the internal benefits. I have to take a poll, and I'm sure some of you might challenge me on this, but I would claim probably none of you are here purely to serve society, right? You're here to, in hopes that you're going to get a better job, make a paycheck, right? You have some internal plans of purchasing your education from Ottawa, but by you doing your own thing, society benefits as well. So we get this dual benefit, an internal benefit of you coming to class, doing your thing because you want to get a job, but then you're creating an external benefit to other people who enjoy that you know something about history and philosophy and you can contribute intelligently to a conversation, right? So you create external benefits as well as internal benefits when you choose to buy education. And so that external benefit is not being reflected in the purchases of education all on its own. We'd like to see more education than what maybe a pure market system would do. And so what does the government do to help that out? How many people have a few student loans or student grants for their education today in class? Let's see a show of hands. Student, federal loans, or, oh yeah, well, just about everybody raising a hand here, right? Well, that's all by design for this reason, maybe not for the reasons you thought. The government's not here to help you necessarily with your internal thing. They care about you as a, uh, as a citizen to some degree, but that's not the real reason they're giving you those federal Pell Grants and, and, and subsidized student loans. They believe that there's a great external benefit to other members of society, and therefore, they encourage you to pursue your education. All right, the last thing is public goods. Some goods don't work so hot in the market system. We call these things public goods. Things like national defense. National defense doesn't work so hot in the market system. It's really expensive. Maybe Warren Buffett could defend himself successfully privately, but in doing so, he's certainly going to protect all of Omaha, right? So if he bought a couple nuclear warheads that he's got in a big barn on some 3,000 acres that he owns, you know, he's got enough billions to possibly protect himself privately. <coughs> and in doing so, he would end up protecting all of Omaha and other people surrounding him, possibly even different parts of the nation if he had some of these nuclear warheads completely under his control pointing in different directions. But in general, even Warren Buffett doesn't have enough of a bankroll that everyone will be protected. And so the market all by itself would fail to produce the appropriate level of national defense all on its own. So the benefits of those goods are non-rival and non-excludable. Warren can't force people, just like the government can't force people. They collect money through taxes and try their best, but it would be hard to force people to pay for something that they get for free anyway. All right, that's probably enough said on that. That's just a quick little flyby of the awesome market system. Sometimes it doesn't work so hot. In general, I call the market system an A student, but on a couple exams, a couple cases, the market system goes out and parties a little too hard and gets an F on that quiz that day or whatever, right? So there's a few examples of where the market system doesn't work so hot. For the most part, we get a lot of good things out of it. Okay. Um, so as we 
set up our system of how we run our country. And there are lots of different examples of how societies set themselves up with government. So I want to look at a spectrum of government. How society sets itself up, so to speak. So at one end of the spectrum, we've got maybe one person, a dictator, Fidel Castro or somebody down here, and we have a centrally planned system. All of the power rests with a single individual. At the other end of the spectrum, we have no government at all. What do we call that? Anarchy. No government. Everybody to each their own, just go for it. All right, and reality is typically somewhere in between. And so to the right side here, we have a system of the United States and, you know, Hong Kong, Japan, mostly free market systems. There's a government in place, but more of a believe the let things kind of work themselves on their own. More, a little more laissez-faire is the word um, Adam Smith used. Did I spell that right? I always screw that one up with the S's and Z's. Who's my French people? It's all right. Uh, what does this mean, my French people, since I have some French people? What's that? Let it be, kind of hands off, leave it alone. That's the concept of laissez-faire. And so that's the thought for government, is that we have little or no, depending on the circumstances. I don't want to even put no, because that's no government there, but little government intervention. Mostly let the market system, the capitalist system, work things out. So for the longest time, I'm not so sure things aren't changing now since I've been teaching this topic for about 20 years. When we talk about the left side liberals and the right side conservatives, the ultra conservatives and the liberal, in the United States, you know, to me we're, now I've got Hong Kong and stuff here, but you know, we're maybe swinging from the right side to the left side. It may not even be that big, but at the end of the day, it's still little or no government intervention. I mean, that's what our country rests on. So whether you swing to the left a little, you swing to the right, I don't really care. We're still believers, well, not everybody, and some people would like to push this direction a lot further, but I kind of always uh, was apolitical. I, I didn't really like politics that much. Um, I always kind of saw, well, for one thing, me being somewhat inconsequential on whether whoever's in president, so I've got a lot of other things to worry about. So I had, I pleaded rational ignorance to voting and caring about politics because I'm not sure I really mattered too much. So that was one little reason. But the other thing was, I really didn't believe that whether it was a Democrat in office or a Republican in office, that it was really gonna affect things materially for me that much in a big way. It's more important for me to be thinking about what I'm gonna do with my time during the day, more of the microeconomic type thinking. What are the decisions I'm doing? Am I pursuing an education? Am I doing this and that? So I still think to this day, uh, even though we've definitely made some moves with, with um, our healthcare system is probably a little bit of a move this way, I still believe at the end of the day, the United States is somewhere over here. We're not drifting to France or Cuba or the former Soviet Union, right? 
those belong kind of this way. That's really moving towards a centrally planned system. And so a lot of those systems have failed over time. I mean, there's really good evidence to suggest that the market-based system is probably going to get you better results and less civil strife as you move uh, society through time. All right, so we're kind of sticking in this realm um, in our market-based economy. Uh, let me pause there for a sec. Questions or comments at all there? All right, so. What makes this system work? What are the decisions that go on day in and day out to make the market system work? So, I want to start you off with my definition of economics. The study of trying to satisfy unlimited wants with limited resources. The study of trying to satisfy unlimited wants with limited resource. And you might be thinking, well, Russ, not everybody has unlimited wants. I mean, let's look at Mother Teresa. I mean, does she have unlimited wants? She, she wasn't a material girl by any stretch. And, uh, you know, I might even be able to make an argument that she even had unlimited wants because she had other people's desires at hand, right? So she would gladly want more things, not for herself, but for the people that she was helping. So in that sense, even Mother Teresa could be argued to have some unlimited wants. Certainly from a society standpoint, we've got lots of people who want and or need things, and we've got limited resources to work with. So I want you to imagine a snapshot in time. Here we are on our island. You might recognize it here. Here's Texas, here's Florida. So what kind of resources are we talking about? What kind of resources do we have at our disposal to use on a given day? Labor, right? We got people. So we got about 300 million people that are running around the island. We got some over in California. We got some over here in New York. and. So we got labor. What else do we got to work with? Land. So we've got Kansas farmland. We've got land here. We've got uh, maybe even a broader definition of land being uh, sunshine, wind, trees, soil, rocks, gold, all kinds of natural resources. We're going to lump into a category called land. So we got labor, land. What else? is a resource that we use to help make other stuff. Capital. So in econ class, capital means machinery, tools, computers, buildings. It does not mean money. That's the main thing it does not mean. It means physical things that help make other things. So I want you to imagine that on a given day, we could take an inventory, kind of a hypothetical inventory for our economy and put everything into four main buckets. Labor, land, capital, and then our last one, <coughs> a little bit harder to get our brains around, but entrepreneurship. This is the uh, group or uh, person or group of people that put these things together. There's a process there that needs to be done, done to get this stuff made. So we've got Entrepreneurship, we're going to use a K for capital because we're going to use a C for something else. Uh, land, we're going to use a uh, LD, just, and labor gets the L. So these are our abbreviations that we'll use. 
labor, land, capital, and entrepreneurship. I would argue that we can put anything you could dream of to help make other things into this bucket. We also need time to do it, but I'm not allowing that into the picture. I'm taking a snapshot in time and saying, what about right now, January 16th at 11.50, what can we put into these buckets? We'll pick up there next time.